I've been in London for a while now, and I have to say I love the Elizabeth line, even if it is looking a bit shabby around the edges. I obviously came to London for when the line opened back in 2022, and now that it's through running, it is just incredibly convenient for getting around the city. No more big hikes at Liverpool Street and Paddington required. But in the time I've spent in London, I've realized something. I've basically not gotten on the tube at all. Sure, I hopped on the Jubilee line to quickly shoot over to Waterloo from Canary Wharf, and I did get on the District line to go to West Brompton to connect to the Overground. Uh, not a tube line, but the reality is I've mostly avoided the Underground. So let's talk about why and how we could change that. You see, I think the Elizabeth line is so nice that it might create a bit of a problem for the rest of the system. At least on corridors where you can reasonably take the Elizabeth line, even if it means a slightly longer journey or more walking. On one hand, getting people off the underground is kind of the point of the Elizabeth line, and clearly it's finding a lot of success in that. But at the same time, to maximize the usefulness of the system, you want people to be taking the most direct trips and not spending too much time in the system if they don't need to. But that's something I'm finding pretty tempting even after only being in London for a while. And before you say, well that's because you're a rail fan, Reese, the reality is the novelty of the Elizabeth line, as great as it is, wore off pretty quickly. Most of the time I'm on the train, I'm looking at memes on my phone. Clearly, there's not only network value for trying to balance out the quality of the various services within London, but also in terms of societal fairness. Not everyone lives along or works along the Elizabeth line, but they should still benefit from the features that modern rail transport brings. So let's talk about the differences between crossrail and the underground in detail, and how we can bridge the gap. And if you're interested in more London videos, make sure you like and subscribe. The first obvious thing that I think stands out between the Elizabeth line and the underground is, well, the trains. The class 345 are not perfect, but I'm actually a big fan, and the materials feel quite hard wearing compared to, say, those on the S-stock underground trains, which these days have some pretty worn down seats and armrests which are not looking great even if they have more cushioning than the seats on the Elizabeth line. And to be fair, they do also have full air conditioning and walk-through carriages, unlike the regular tube stock. The wayfinding, while imperfect on the 345s, seriously, there are so many screens to wade through, is still better than the LED dot screens you see on basically every other TFL vehicle, from the DLR to the tube to the overground. By the way, if you're not getting this whole tube versus subsurface line thing, check out the video I did explaining the London Underground for more, and then come back here. Though I do think there should be a large format tube map somewhere on the train, similar to how you see the New York subway map in New York. I'll also say that I appreciate that the Liz Line trains have free Wi-Fi, like the new Overground trains. Sure, you're probably not going to rely on the free transit Wi-Fi all that often, but as a frequent traveler, it's very useful, and sometimes your cell service just isn't working, or you have a device that just doesn't have cellular data on it. Now, I know that not all devices work as well with the Elizabeth Line Wi-Fi, which is strange. The iPhone seems worse than Android, but it's still a useful feature. It's especially useful because London has this really silly approach where if you want to use the in-station Wi-Fi, you need an account with a cell carrier, which at that point you're probably using data anyways. Now, as it turns out, a lot of the features that make the Elizabeth Line trains so nice could easily be ported over to the more traditional trains on the network. For example, the new Tube for London trains, which <laughs> are still a mouthful, have fully open gangways, air conditioning that should work above ground at the very least, and they'll probably also have better digital wayfinding, not to mention those harder wearing materials that I like so much on the Elizabeth line. Now, speaking of that nicer digital wayfinding, it should probably be retrofitted into the S-Stock trains, which also have enough room to have full-scale tube maps, perhaps near the gangways. I also do really think that having free Wi-Fi across the tube would be really nice, even if it's not an instantaneous thing and it takes some gradual rollout with new trains. So essentially, by retrofitting the still fairly youthful S-Stock trains on the subsurface network and buying a ton of new new Tube for London tube trains, we could retrofit the Elizabeth Line passenger experience on the trains as much as possible over to the underground. The second and arguably bigger element that separates the underground and the Elizabeth line is the environment, which is mostly stations but not entirely. 
To be clear, there's no doubt in my mind that the Elizabeth Line stations are not perfect. There's a lot of walking required, especially at locations such as Liverpool Street, but the access is good. The spaces are very wide open, and there's generally escalators everywhere you need to go, which isn't always true on the underground. Step-free access is also a lot better on the Elizabeth Line, as long as you're in the central section. It is crazy that they didn't implement level boarding outside of the city centre, but that's a story for another video. I should say that those larger spaces benefit from being designed around an existing context rather than being piecemeal upgraded with more connections and entrances over the years. And I actually think the size of the Elizabeth Line stations kind of helps with wayfinding as well. Since the stations are so long, you usually only have one way or the other to go. Another awesome element of the core stations on the Elizabeth Line that are underground is the platform screen doors, which have really nice digital wayfinding screens above them. They aren't perfectly used, like the on-train wayfinding, but they have a lot of potential for the future. Now honestly, I think a big benefit of the platform screen doors is insulating passengers from the noise of trains, which is where we get into talking about the environment of the Elizabeth Line a bit more. The tube and even parts of the subsurface network in open cuts often have really horrendous air quality. It's something I notice whenever I use them. This is an actual health hazard, and by comparison, the air quality on the Elizabeth Line feels way, way higher, and the air is also cooler, which helps a lot. But the environmental thing I notice the most while riding the London Underground is the ear-shattering noise when you're traveling in certain sections, for example, on the Jubilee Line. Now maybe I'm just more sensitive than most people, or more likely I'm trying to protect my hearing, but there are sections underground that are uncomfortable because of how loud and shrieking the sounds of the trains are. The Elizabeth Line just doesn't really suffer from this stuff, and platform screen doors also clearly help. So how could TFL upgrade the underground so you have a bit more of the creature comfort you see on Old Lizzy? Well, I think it starts with an acknowledgement. London has a huge but old public transport system, and while expanding it is valuable, investing in the old parts to try to bring them up to snuff is also a valuable use of funds. Upgrading old stuff could bring huge dividends for riders, and it might even be more cost-effective in some cases than building entirely new stuff, still unlocking new capacity and a better experience. One obvious way to do more of that is to do more bank-style station expansions at other stations around the network prioritized by the ability to expand capacity and improve flow, as well as open up the space and deal with congestion. While projects like the bank expansion happen at other city center stations, they can also focus on improving ventilation, doing level boarding, and creating more of an Elizabeth Line-like experience, which would be really nice. And now, to be completely clear, I'm not suggesting one or two bank-style projects. You could easily do 10 or 20, should the funds be made available. And I think even more above-ground rebuilds of surface and open-cut stations would be really valuable and probably much more cost-effective than all of that underground work. And I think if this was done, it should be an entire program of works, where there's a kind of assembly line process of going from one station to the next and another, getting economies of scale and learning from one project and taking those learnings to the next. And what about air quality, heat, and noise? These are obviously massive problems, but they've been known about for a long time, and they still haven't been addressed. The reality is pretty simple. If you want to dramatically improve the heat and air quality in the underground, you need to massively improve ventilation, which is going to be extremely expensive, but that doesn't mean it's not worth it. London is a huge city, one of the great economic centers of the world, and the Tube is one of the busiest metros in the world. If anywhere should be investing in improving the quality of the existing system, it is London. As I mentioned before, big station rebuilds, but really any kind of major work on underground sections of the network should incorporate a heat and air quality lens, and building additional ventilation shafts, gigantic ones with huge jet fans and everything, that should be something that's on the table. If you're interested in more on this topic, Drago Hazard has a ton of videos talking about the history of heat and ventilation on the tube, so I'll try to link some up here. With regard to sound, I think it's much the same. While large projects are happening, sound mitigation measures should be considered and installed. And if it's not already planned, new tube trains should clearly have far better sound insulation. Platform screen doors can play into both of these issues, potentially reducing sound on platform level, but also making ventilation a bit worse. Nonetheless, the benefits are obviously worth it, and any new station or infrastructure should be built with the assumption that platform screen doors will eventually be installed. 
And since it seems like the new tube for London trains will probably have the new standard door layout for underground trains, they should probably be designed around that door layout as opposed to those on, say, the Jubilee line. Of course, to actually install platform screen doors, you need upgraded signaling, which is another big thing London should invest in. It's expensive, but it could be a rolling program from one line to the next, increasing capacity, improving convenience, and also increasing reliability and reducing maintenance costs. Lots of good stuff. Now obviously, everything I've talked about in this video will cost money, and that's money that TfL doesn't currently have. And while I think that all of this expansion and improvement would improve ridership numbers and also reduce operating costs, you can't build what you don't have the money to pay for. But the reality is that clearly today's TfL funding issues cannot continue. It's just completely untenable and frankly insane to squeeze the network that keeps one of the world's great cities running this hard when it's clearly already very efficient. So in the meantime, I'll keep dreaming of the Lizlineification of the underground. Thanks for watching.